Hi friends, I'm Kim Adamski, HIV prevention specialist at the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective. Um, we have had a couple installments thus far on our um, LGBTQ experiences with religion series. Last week we had uh, Tony Ferriolo, uh, which was lovely. And this week we have Don Ennis um, for our final, for now, installment. Um, so uh, in case you don't know, the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective is located at 1841 Broad Street in the south end of Hartford. We offer dental, uh, STD and HIV testing, sexual wellness visits, um, and also education and support uh, groups and programming. So uh, on Monday, we are having an HIV testing day, uh, which will be from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we do have some slots left. Um, and that's everything. So how about Don, you introduce yourself, talk about yourself a little. I will, and I want to start by saying, get tested. Even if you are not active, get tested. It's really important. Mm -hmm. I've been tested. Everyone I know should be tested. Agreed. My name is Don Ennis. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Don Ennis. I am a transgender woman, but I like to say that being trans is like the fifth most interesting thing about me. <laughs> I am a mom, a uh, single mom, a widow. I live in West Hartford, been here 17 years. I'm a journalist. I am a college professor. I've been a podcaster. I write for uh, several publications, Forbes.com, The Daily Beast, Los Angeles Blade. I was managing editor of Outsports for two and a half years, which is an LGBT sports site. Yes, there are gay people who like sports and trans people like me and lesbians and non-binary folks. And this is a really exciting year because the Olympics are happening. I mean, sort of weird, scary but we may actually have for the very first time transgender competitors in the Olympics. At least, at least two people I know are competing. One is a trans non-binary soccer player. The other is a transgender weightlifter from New Zealand. So we have a lot of interesting things happening this summer. Plus it's pride. And in West Hartford, we're celebrating West Hartford pride. We had a, uh, a event last night called Tell Me a Story in which storytellers you know, we're able to uh, bear their souls. And this Saturday, we're going to meet in Blueback Square with a big bunch of celebrations. So um, I have three kids. That's the most important job I have is being their mom. Uh, it's a job I inherited. Uh, they still call me dad because that's my name. And uh, more than anything, I would say that um, I'm living my best life. Yay, that's really great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Don. Um, so... As I said, the topic, LGBTQ experiences with religion. So first, um, did you grow up with a religion, Don? And what, what religion? What was it like? I grew up Roman Catholic. Same. And the kind of Roman, <laughs> yeah. And the kind of Roman Catholic where my mother dragged us to church every single morning. <laughs> I mean, every morning. Oh. And you know, this was, I guess, to train us so that we would not misbehave on Sundays. Um, <laughs> I was also an altar boy. Uh, I got to um, be an altar boy at my sister's graduation. Um, I uh, grew up thinking, you know, if priests could get married, I'd be a priest. But I'm really glad that priests can't get married because I don't think I'd have enjoyed it being a priest. Um, I went to a Catholic grade school and a Catholic high school. Matter of fact, it was an all boys Catholic high school. I'm proud to say that I am the only female graduate of that all boys high school on Long Island, and despite what you think, we had a, a, a retreat for alumni, and I let them know, hey, I'm me, and they said, no, come, and they actually adjusted the prayer that when they said, uh, please pray for all our brothers and our sister, <laughs> oh, I was sweet. welcomed. I was really welcomed, I was really surprised, and it felt really good, but I have to say, when the Pope and our uh, Archbishop here in Hartford started making a lot of noise about transgender people, I went to the pastor of my church and I said, you know, I know you have made me feel comfortable and the congregants all welcome me, but I don't feel comfortable anymore. And it was on the first anniversary of my wife's death that it occurred to me, now I married a Jew. When Catholics have children, they're born sort of like a blank slate. You baptize them and they are born into the church. When a Jewish woman gives birth, they are automatically Jewish. 
So even before we got engaged, my wife and I decided, well, the children are going to be Jewish no matter what we do. So that's how we raised them. And my parents, who are Catholic, asked me only one question about it. They said, are you going to raise them to believe in God? And I said, absolutely. And that was good enough. When my son was three, my oldest of two sons, he said to us, you know, Dad, I feel bad. How about we help you celebrate Christmas and you'll help us celebrate Hanukkah? So that's what we did. I still celebrated my Christian holidays, Christmas and Easter predominantly. And my uh, children all celebrated uh, the Jewish holidays with my wife. And I participated in that. And ever since moving to West Hartford, I've been very active in our synagogue. As a matter of fact, at Congregation Beth Israel, I was the chairwoman of the adult learning committee. The transgender Catholic woman was running the adult learning committee. So talk about reform and acceptance, right? But I decided I would convert. And it wasn't because of my kids and it wasn't because of my wife dying. It was, I felt like I needed a change. I feel, and I wanted to embrace the community that had embraced me and to reject the community that was rejecting me. So uh, I wrote a long thing on Medium about this, basically saying I left the church before it left me. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not heartbroken about it, to be honest. I'm very happy. And mm -hmm. tomorrow night, I will be speaking uh, right before the Mourners Kaddish at Congregation Beth Israel as we celebrate Pride Shabbat. Oh, my gosh, that's so great. I will post the link to that article if you send it to me in the description, too, uh, when this is uploaded. So if anybody wants to read it, you'll know where to find it. Happy to um, do so. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, you know what I actually learned recently on TikTok is that the Talmud acknowledges eight genders, which I thought was really cool. I never knew that. <laughs> and I'm actually on TikTok, which I know for a 57-year-old <laughs> woman, my students are always like, you're on TikTok. My kids are like, ugh. But I'm on um, TikTok for work and personal. So <laughs> I, I do nothing personal, but I am part of a LGBT group called Sports Equality Foundation. Mm -hmm. And our message is it's okay to come out. And if you don't want to come out, that's okay too. But we want to welcome people who are in the closet and let them know that it's okay. And mm -hmm. um, especially athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, at what point did you realize that you were LGBTQ um, and like, how did that affect your faith and your, um, your feelings about your religion? Well, as we've established, I'm old. All right. So uh, I was talking to my dinosaur. No, I, I was four years old and I looked in the mirror and I was just looking at myself and I was trying to figure out why am I different? Why am I not like other boys? And I asked my mother and I told her, I'm a girl. And she said, no, 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 you're so special. You're special. And that was the way my mother had dealt with it. When I told my parents that boys would call me fag, they said, oh, that's an Irish word for cigarette. <laughs> well, they didn't accept the fact that I knew I was a girl. But um, after catching me wearing a bra, after uh, seeing me um, establish that I wanted to be treated as a girl, um, I had been a child model since the age of four. Um, my mother got the idea that, you know, gee, since he wants to be a girl and looks like a girl and acts like a girl, why don't we have her model as a girl? And I did. I did radio commercials and modeling for about five years as a girl from age 12 to about 16 until um, my father found out. And then I stopped doing that. As far as the faith goes, I basically stopped thinking about transgender because my father had basically forbidden it. Although he called me Mary and he often mocked my long nails, um, he tried to motivate me by bullying into being more manly and it just didn't work. Um, but I followed the script. I wanted to please my parents. I met a girl, married a girl, had kids, and I never thought I'd ever be able to fulfill the secret dream of mine. And then he died. And when my dad died, it was a real crisis of faith for me. And this was the most important man in my life. And it was like a dividing line, just like 9-11. It was a dividing line in my life. And I, I, I realized that this was the time. This was the cue. This was the message of life is short. And just like my BFF, we both decided after our father's death that we were not going to hide anymore. Um, I came out uh, in 2013, eight years ago. And I actually came out to my rabbi in 2012, right before my oldest son's bar mitzvah. I needed to hit for him to know what was going on. And he said two things to me that really stuck by me. He said, first, don't get such a big head. You're not the first one. 
Second, he said, God made you in her or his image. You are God's child and God sees you no matter how you present. If you are transgender, if you're a woman, that's how God sees you. And I was so encouraged by that. I wish I could have been me for his bar mitzvah, but um, that wasn't in the cards. Mm -hmm. So would I you was, say, I, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. No, I was going to say, I, I, was, I was me for my daughter's bat mitzvah, but because my wife had been um, diagnosed with cancer, she asked me to not appear as myself. Mm -hmm. So as a gift to her, um, I, uh, you know, yeah. appeared as the old persona one more time. It was mm -hmm. a bit of a crisis of faith for me too, but um, it's a dying woman's wish. Why would I say no? Yeah, I can see why that would, uh, yeah, I can see why. Would you say that in general, the Jewish faith is very accepting of trans folks or specifically your community? If you go to Israel, I am an abomination, just like I am in fundamentalist churches throughout mm. the, uh, no matter what Christianity you follow. Um, the Orthodox do not accept mm -hmm. uh, transgender identities. I don't think they even accept the LGB. Um, mm. We have neighbors who are Orthodox who I say hello to every day and they basically ignore me as if I don't exist. And that's okay. Hey, you know what? I respect their wishes. Yeah. They hopefully will respect ours. It is what it is. Con and the conservative Jews, for the most part, are part of the LGBT community, but it's the reform movement that has really come to embrace mm -hmm. uh, LGBTQ. Um, I felt that um, my congregation specifically, Congregation Beth Israel, was um, more than welcoming, very accepting, and um, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And never, never did I ever feel as if I was not welcome. Is that the one that's just right on Farmington Ave? The one with the big dome. Yes. The big terracotta dome. A lot of construction going on there at the moment. Yeah, I passed it the other day and I was like, huh, I wonder why all religions except for Christian religions call it a temple and not a church. And then I just walked back down the street. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're the one with the pride flag out front. Um, yes. We have, yeah. a, we have a big star of David on ours uh, just mm -hmm. to signify our Jewishness. And um, <laughs> what's interesting is that there are so many things you can call that building. Mm -hmm. Synagogue, temple, shul, yeah. um, house of worship. Um, we love, uh, Congregation Beth Israel. We love CBI as we call it. Um, and more than anything, it has loved us. And when my wife was ill and times are tough, uh, the neighborhood rallied around me. I worked in the television news business for a very long time. And a lot of my colleagues have moved all across the country. And that means I've had like two or three years, maybe even every year and a half, finding a new neighborhood. Had we done that, had I followed that trajectory, we wouldn't have had the support we had when we needed it most. I'm really glad that we put up roots here in West Hartford. Uh, the neighbors um, couldn't be better. Just It's like the UN. I love it. Very diverse. <laughs> I agree. West Hartford's a really nice town. Um, it's, it, it is fairly diverse. You're right. Um, so, okay. So when you um, came out, you said your religious group was pretty accepting of you. Um, prior to your daughter's Ba mitzvah, were they aware of, uh, you know, like your true self? Yeah. No, oh, I, okay. when I, um, when I, when I came out in 2013, uh, it not only made, um, you know, Facebook because, because you post things on Facebook about your food. Why wouldn't you post your gender transition? Yeah. Um, unfortunately it also made the media. I was on the front page of the New York post. It was horrible. It New was York actually post. The, wow. the New York Post. Yeah, I know. I was the first one in television network news. So oh, right. uh, for whatever reason, okay. they decided it was newsworthy. And mm -hmm. the rabbi at the time actually wanted to write an angry letter to the Post complaining about their coverage. But I told him, I said, don't add gasoline to the flames. Yeah. We just want it to die down, you know. Um, but no, people were very accepting the, the, from the rabbis all the way down to every congregant. And if there was somebody who didn't approve or didn't like it, well, they didn't get in my face about it, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah. People are always going to disapprove of something you do, right? I, I don't. I'm not here to please anybody except you know my kids and to make them happy. And mm -hmm. I try to make myself happy every day. I try to be kind to others, and I respect that not everybody gets it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question, by the way, Kim. Yeah. Are you righty or left? Are you righty or lefty? A righty. So Hannah Simpson is a transgender activist who's Jewish, and she invited me once to march in the Israel Day Parade. Um, I was very thrilled by that. She explains in this metaphor she created that if you were to write with your left hand, what would that look like? Bad. <laughs> yeah. So imagine well, my handwriting right. already looks bad, so. <laughs> <laughs> Same. 
well, imagine all your life you were writing with your left hand. And then mm-hmm. I came along one day and I said, Kim, try writing with your right hand. You'd be like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is how it should be. That's what gender identity is like. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, that's, Great little, I like little that metaphor little I like to share with people because, you know, it's something that people really have trouble understanding. Like, mm-hmm. how can you be not understanding who your gender is? And I'm like, yeah. well, I knew my gender was, but I was looking at my body and my reflection in the mirror, not seeing what I thought I should be seeing Mm -hmm. until I fixed it. Yeah. I think now also because trans folks are more like publicly in the spotlight and stuff, folks like kids know that that's like an option. Yeah. Um, Which is great. That's, and I mean, that's why we're seeing so many kids uh, like come out as non-binary and trans and stuff. It's not like very true. More kids are trans. It's just more comfortable with it. Yeah, exactly. I don't think there's a a trend or anything is happening. What I think is, is that people are allowing people to identify themselves as they want to identify. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a matter of knowing all along, but just not being able to exercise it. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I, I, I I try my uh, women in the office would say to me, Oh, you know, it's so nice and refreshing to see a man who doesn't mind wearing bright colors. Like I would wear a red shirt or a blue shirt or a green shirt. Most guys wear gray, blue, Mm -hmm. black, you know, the same business suit kind of thing. And I like wearing colors and I liked wearing um, things that, you know, made me feel like in touch with my own identity. So Mm -hmm. surprise to those women. Yeah. (laughs) Honestly, though, it's so wild how, how rigid, like gender, like gender expectations are like, why would it be weird for a man to wear a red shirt or something like that's right. (laughs) That's okay. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. (laughs) I think, I think more than anything, people are stuck in um so you know society's decisions of what we should do and be yeah. and and maybe in 2021 it's time to put that stuff aside mm-hmm. social construct that's what i always say exactly <laughs> exactly so back to uh being the first trans person in a tv net, uh, network newsroom um so you said uh, obviously that wasn't great when the new york post reported on it but what was it like at work um like were people cool about it there or if you read the post, I just showed up one day in a um, wig and a, 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 you know, a mini, a, a black, uh, you know, a black dress, a, a, a little black dress, LBD, right? Um, oh, that'd be pretty so, wild. <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's not. It's, that's not how I showed up. Of course, that's not how yeah. it worked. Um, I had negotiations with work. Um, I brought a picture in of myself. They had meetings of three with everyone I interacted with to say, this is what Don is going to be looking like from now on. You have any issues? You want to talk about it? Now is the time. I went to work on a Wednesday as Don. I took Thursday off and I came into work on a Friday as myself. I had already talked to my team because I was the leader on the assignment desk. So I was in charge and I wanted them to know before like the whole big announcement thing. And yeah, people were great about it. I mean, everyone basically just went about their work. There was like a big announcement on a company-wide com- uh, conference call and I got a round of applause, which was nice. That Boss is nice. Flowers. It made me feel so awkward, though, at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit like, I don't need attention, thank you. And <laughs> the boss left um, flowers on my desk, which was really Aww. nice. And, and really, you know, I got a flood of email, and then it made the, you know, the news. And what was really sad about it was is that when it made the news, this is 2013. Mm-hmm. I don't think this would happen today. Mm-hmm. But I had reporters hiding in bushes. I had uh, photographers who were ambushing my kids, my mother, my mother-in-law, my sister. Mm-hmm. One paparazzi went up and down the block, knocking on doors, asking if they knew the tranny who lived next door. And I hadn't even told the neighbors because, you know, it's not something you like to say, hey, by the way, neighbor, sorry to interrupt you mowing the lawn, but I'm transgender. You know, it's like, and you know what? All my neighbors said, screw you. And I closed the door well, that's and really they good, supported me. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, we were holed up here for a couple of days. We, um, we did not want that kind of attention and shock jocks and comedians and things. It just wasn't, it wasn't at all healthy for me. Um, I'll, I'll be very upfront with you. The media spotlight uh, was not something I was expecting. And my family, of course, blamed Facebook. How could you post it on Facebook? I'm like, you post your dog's birthday on Facebook. I'm not going to post that I'm a woman now on Facebook. Come on. But the time was that I just didn't handle it well. And mm-hmm. Um, a mental health therapist uh, helped me understand. It was like a circuit breaker went off and I um, had a, a breakdown. Ended up I can hospital. understand why. I mean, that's just transitioning in general is very stressful. Like having all that. 
I, 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 I was definitely not in touch with reality and it took me a while. Um, I needed time to reassess and to reevaluate. And that also, of course, what did it do? It made headlines. And um, the New York Post had a field day with me. So um, by the time I finally got around to figuring it all out and getting it all together, um, the company had sort of soured on me and they decided that I was uh, 30 plus years as a man, uh, an award-winning journalist, but one year as a woman and I was a screw up. So I got uh, let go for performance issues. Um, yeah, I feel like that's something that happens to women in general a lot more than men. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I talked to, I talked to them about the fact that, you know, I used to be a very aggressive man and a, and a, and a tough boss. And now suddenly I'm a bitch because I'm a woman. Yep. You know? <laughs> Good old sexism. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was hard. Um, that was my career for 30 years. Um, I was hoping to transition to another, sorry for the bad pun there, but go to a different network. And uh, someone at the network that I used to work at NBC at the Today Show, he let it be known he wouldn't work with me. And he's a star. So um, that didn't go anywhere. So I decided I would try something new. And I've been an online journalist ever since. But... In 2017, I started hosting my own talk show, and I've never been in front of the camera except as a child. So um, for the last, you know, four years, I have a show called Rise Up with Don Ennis, and it's on YouTube and on West Hartford Community TV. And starting in 2019, I started being a correspondent for Channel 8. Four times a year, we have a program called Connecticut Voice Out Loud, and I'm on that show, and I'll be on this Saturday night at 1130. That's awesome. That's yeah, really, I mean, fun. that's pretty great that overall it went pretty, like it ended up okay for you. Cause I mean, I feel like people uh, like interpret like sports culture as very misogynistic and of course it can be, but yes, it, it seems like it, you know, you've, you've managed to make it your own. <laughs> I have, I, I think that a lot of um, parts of our male dominated culture, despite the fact that we outnumber men, um, <laughs> we are, uh, are subject to their whims and wishes. Um, men don't think that women's sports is real sports. Men don't think that women can do the same job. Mm -hmm. um, and we are fighting back against that. We're pushing back mm -hmm. against that. Um, I'm also a big believer in reproductive justice, which you know my temple supports, my Catholic church did not. And I argue that I don't want a man telling me what to do with my body either. So absolutely, I'm a big, big, big supporter of reproductive uh, rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So, all right, before we end, uh, what are, what do you think are some good ways that people of faith can work to be more inclusive and can work within their churches to make their churches and temples and whatnot more inclusive? Well, I want people to understand that when someone says they love someone, we should accept that. Just because it doesn't fit our definition of love shouldn't be something that we decide, well, that's gay marriage or that's, you know, um, uh, same sex marriage. Love is love. And if you don't support gay marriage, then don't get gay married. Okay. Yeah. As far as, as far as the non-binary, I understand that people like me who are older are having some difficulty accepting and understanding they, them. Listen, Shakespeare used they, them. Mm -hmm. All right. It's not really new. And yeah. people who are non-binary, some of them identify as trans, some identify as just as non-binary. Mm -hmm. And all they want is to be respected for their own individuality. Mm -hmm. How hard is that? Yeah. I, wear a, I wear a pendant around my neck and it says, be kind. If everyone mm -hmm. would just be kind to everyone else, no matter what their faith is, no matter what their identity or orientation is, I think this would be a happier place. I don't think there's a reason why any house of worship would turn away someone who wants to join in the communion of celebrating a higher power and i also respect that there are people who are agnostic and atheist and that's okay i guess we'll all find out when we finally you know turn it in right when we finally punch our cards but for me i, I believe in that higher power and i believe i felt that presence you know all throughout my life and you know there are a lot of people who quote bible statistics and and quotations and scriptures and things look we're not doing all the things that we were supposed to do 3,000 years ago. So why would you take those particular things and apply it to today anyway? Yeah. Just be kind. Mm -hmm. And um, and as far as, you know, the transgender people like me, if you get to know one of us, I think you'll be surprised. A lot of people just don't 
know anyone who's trans. Mm -hmm. My handle on social media is life after dawn. I live in West Hartford. I'm in the phone book, as we used to call it. Reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help you understand. I, I, I do public speaking. Would you believe I spoke at a group of Jewish girls called B'nai B'rith, and they made me an honorary B'nai B'rith girl. Oh. That is one of, it is one of the highlights of my life that I am a B'nai B'rith girl. Oh, that's and, nice. And it, it just means the world to me that I would be accepted like that. And mm -hmm. my, my question to anyone who doesn't accept LGBTQ people, if you're a Christian, are you really a Christian? Because that's like not the Christian that I was. My Christian faith was love the way you want to be loved mm -hmm. and love your neighbor. And I think Jesus would be marching with us on pride if he were here today. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and I think God, I think she believes in uh, LGBTQ and loves all. So, mm -hmm. you know, including the people who don't believe in her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what would you tell somebody who has uh, like relatives who are like object to LGBTQ folks on the basis of religion? Well, first of all, let's take a moment to respect. We have to respect them too, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's entitled to their beliefs, even if they're wrong, <laughs> <laughs> but give them space, mm -hmm. give them opportunity to grow. Maybe it's just a knee jerk reaction. Maybe it's something that they haven't really thought about. Maybe introduce them to people who can help them. There is in the Catholic Church a LGBT liaison to the Vatican, a Catholic priest, Father James Martin. Maybe in Judaism, you meet someone who is a gay rabbi. Maybe in other Christian faiths, you meet other parents who are conservatives, but still have transgender children. It doesn't mean you have to be a freaking flaming liberal or a, a, a you know, flaming gay person to be someone who is supportive. You can still be who you are. It just means not to be rejecting. And those people who are facing that rejection, a therapist once told me, it's better to have no relationship than a toxic one. And if it can't be worked out, I encourage them to find their family of choice. And that's something I've been blessed with. I, I feel bad for some people because all they have is their family of choice. And a lot of it is online because of COVID or whatever. But um, I've been very, very lucky to have found my family, both my cousins in real life and my, I call her my sister. She's uh, someone with the same last name as me who we found on Facebook together. And she's closer than my actual uh, sister is who I don't have a relationship with anymore. It's sad. Um, I will tell you that it hurt me that my mother rejected me. So I know what that feels like. But I also made my peace with her. I did my best to try and fix that and seal that uh, wound. But um, there's nothing you can do about some people. So just accept and understand that instead of forcing yourself on someone, give them the space they may need. And I, I think it's true in dating too. Sometimes instead of pursuing so hard, Maybe if you pull back a little bit, make them work for it. Maybe they'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good advice on both parts. All right. Well, I think our time is just about up, but thank you so much. This was a really good chat. And um, would you mind provi providing contact info if folks have like questions or comments or concerns? <laughs> Absolutely. And you can reach me either like in the DM or a personal message or an email. It's real simple. Life after dawn. That's my social media handle across all platforms, Life After Dawn, except I think Snapchat is Dawn Stacy Ennis. That's my middle name with an E, Dawn Stacy with an E-Y, Ennis. Um, and I'm rarely ever on Snapchat, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> and then um, email is my name, dawnennis at gmail.com. And like I said, I'm in the phone book, but you know, it, it, okay, there's no phone book anymore. I'm on Whitepages.com. <laughs> yeah, whitepages.com. But um, I, I encourage people and also, if you're in a position where you're not sure maybe you're trans or gay or lesbian or something and you need somebody to talk to you about it, I'm your girl. That's awesome. It's a great resource. Um, I will put all of your contact info in the description when I upload the video, uh, which will be uploaded to facebook.com slash HGLHC and also tweeted and whatever, you know, all the stuff. <laughs> get tested. Hashtag get tested. Yes, get tested. <laughs>
uh, Monday the 28th or any Monday or Thursday when we have clinic. Um, again, Health Collective is located at 1841 Broad Street. Um, you can email me at kima at hglhc.org. Uh, you can also call us at 860-278-4163. Um, so thank you so much, Dawn, for uh, going live. Um, make sure you stop at our table at Pride. I won't be there, but Dan will be in if he volunteers. So, um, and I'm sure I'll see you soon. Looking forward to it. Have a great night. Take care. Bye.